7.30 on a Monday morning. We're super excited to have you. We've got some guest speakers for you today. Um, but welcome to Apollo 3. Thank you for considering it and being curious. This Apollo 3 would be our fifth cohort of schools choosing to redesign their systems. And so we're really excited to have you here today. We've got a, about an hour of information. I apologize that it's going to be a talk at you kind of thing, but we're also recording it if you need to refer back to it later. And besides that, it is 7.30 in the morning. Maybe you don't feel like talking and would just like to absorb and ponder Apollo 3. And so with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jay Scott. Thanks, Tammy. So we've got a uh, distinguished panel of guest speakers with us this morning. We can't wait for them to hear from them. So we've got Dr. Brad Neuenswander. He's our deputy commissioner here at KSDE. We've got Dr. Doug Meckel. He is with KASB, but also with the Regional Comprehensive Center. And then we have from our from Southwest Plains, we have Kim Mock, who will be providing kind of the, the ESC lens, the Educational Service Center lens to the conversation this morning. And we're really excited. We've got Jacqueline Fitzenmeyer from Clay County talking about how Clay County has approached redesign. So super excited uh, about, about uh, the sessions this morning and uh, ready and, and willing to, to listen to our guest speakers. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Good morning. So this is our agenda, what we want to cover today. We want to just give a little background on the redesign initiative in Kansas. We also want to take some time to talk with you about how redesign can support you in navigating next and um, just kind of help build out those alignments. Give a little background on what is it, right? We jump in, what are we doing? How are we going to accomplish this? Um, and then we're going to get some personal one-on-one -on -one, um, expertise from our guests, um, just about how do you make the time and how do you make it really happen for your school or your system. So excited to jump into our content this morning. And our first um, speaker up this morning is Dr. Brad Neuenswander. He's just going to give us a little bit of background on the Redesign Initiative in Kansas. Thanks, Sarah. And it's really good to see everybody at 730 on a nice sunny uh, Monday morning. Uh, hopefully you're all enjoying uh, the, the weather and it's just going to be a great start to the week to get to spend a little bit of time with you. Uh, so Sarah, if you want to go, uh, there you go. So this all started with a, a vision that came off the year 2015 when Randy and I traveled the state listen to over 2000 Kansans about what it is that we wanted to do in the direction we wanted to go. And then the state board took all of that information uh, that we received from the field and came up with their new vision, which is, as we all know by now, um, we truly do believe that in Kansas, we can lead the world in the success of each student, uh, but we can't do it if we just continue to do schooling as we, we have over the past several, um, I would say decades, uh, clear back to when many of us uh, went through school and, and our system still, although we've made a lot of gains and a lot of progress, overall it still looks very similar uh, to what we all grew up in. So if you wanna advance, so when you think back to what Kansans told us, and we asked them clearly to describe a successful young 24-year-old, uh, there were two different audiences, the general community, and then we went back out and talked to business and industry. They were very clear that the vast majority of the skills that we wanted were non-academic. And even though it was clear academics has its place. Obviously, students need uh, to, to know their math, their science, their English language art, all of the content areas. But in, in the red, they were very clear that, but they've got to be able to think critically about those and those instrumental 
uh, academic skills, they've got to be able to apply them and use them in real world application. But the vast majority of the skills that young Kansans need, and, and we all know this to be true, are those non-academic, those interpersonal and intrapersonal. And business and industry was even more, they, you know, 81% of the skills that they indicated were interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. And the challenge is we're not, we've never been designed as a system to really focus on those. So we took those and we built a new vision and then we partnered with uh, the Kansans, uh, the competency framework out of KU. And we took those and said, all right, if this is what Kansans say we value, then how do we go about implementing and focusing on it? And since the tour, we took that competency wheel and we asked over 10,000 Kansans, if you could pick one skill that you would want with your child or with your grandchild or, or some child that's close and important to you, over 10,000 of them said, these are perseverance, integrity, self-regulation, problem solving, initiative, empathy, Again, just reassuring us that if that's what we value, then how can we approach learning differently than what we have in the past? And I believe less than 10 people out of those 10,000 ever mentioned content knowledge as the number one. So this has really been trying to has really driven our passion and the work going forward. So Sarah, you can go ahead. So the state board said, you know what? A successful high school graduate, while academic preparation is still important, we need the co cognitive preparation, the technical skills, the employability skills, and being uh, able to make sure our kids graduate knowing how to be civically engaged. And this has been a huge focus of redesign. And I would argue this pandemic has really opened up maybe some of the gaps and the holes that we had in our system, because how do we serve our communities and our students in a pandemic if we're not focusing on these things. Because staff struggled, students struggled, because they didn't have going into this the cognitive preparation, the technical skills, those employability skills, how to self-regulate, how to be, how to persevere. And that's where um, we saw many of our districts that had gone through redesign and gone through the process, and we hit this pandemic, were able to navigate through it a little easier because that's what they were doing. And even though it wasn't easy for them, they had some things in place to help them work their way through it. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Sarah. Again, when we look at the board outcomes of socio-emotional growth. We know even before this pandemic, there were students that, that struggled in that area. Early childhood and kindergarten readiness. We know that this pandemic has caused, it could very well next year be one of the largest kindergarten classes we've had because we had a drop of about 8% in kindergarten and a drop of about 14% in early childhood. So many parents decided we're gonna keep our kids at home. So what happened during this past year for many of those four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds that did not enroll? That's something we're gonna have to look at going into Apollo 3 and going into preparing uh, for, the, for the next school year. Individual plans of study, again, a huge piece of redesign. 
a huge piece of the board's vision. How do we take that and start in the earlier and build true personalized individual plans of study for our students? High school graduation rates, it's, they continue to go up slightly as a state, but again, it's a, a huge board outcome to how do we not only increase the likelihood a student is gonna graduate from high school, but to have those skills to be successful post-secondary in the workforce, in the military. And then we've been following post-secondary completion. This pandemic, has got to be a way for us to shed some light on the graduating class of 21, the graduating class of 22. I mean, it has totally disrupted post-secondary plans for a lot of our students. You know, speaking personally, I've got a freshman in college. It is different than the freshman experience of every college going freshmen in the past. How do we prepare kids for something that might look totally different? So go ahead, Sarah. So that is what led us to redesign after Kansans told us, this is what we want to do differently. As Jay and Tammy mentioned, we are now in Apollo 3. We've had our Mercury, our Gemini, our early Apollos. We keep going through and saying, if that's what Kansans say we want, then we've got a group of fearless schools and districts out there that say, we're going to approach this and figure out how might we do this differently. So I'm gonna kick it over to Dr. Doug Meckel who's going to visit just a little bit about the why. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see you, and it is early, but uh, it, it's a great day in Kansas. Brad just framed the, the whole initiative related to redesign. We've got to find a way to, to improve what we're doing for, for every child in Kansas. So, so Sarah, if you'll go to the next slide, I, I wanna kind of follow up on, on how do we get started down this process? But before I do that, I just have to ask, I mean, I have been involved in hundreds, hundreds of Zoom meetings since last March. And I've never had two Greg Clarks on the same meeting. And now I think it's even two different Greg Clarks. So if Greg Clark number two, would turn his camera on. I've had to validate that you are not the same people. Okay, I've, I've lost Greg Clark number two, but Greg Clark number one, I see so many familiar faces. I thought I would follow up, but I've never seen Greg Clark number two until today. The world so, can barely handle one. The world can barely, well, we're glad we have two at the same meeting. So Brad framed a great thought for us. The state board took everything we'd learned about what Kansas said they wanted for kids and said, this is the vision. And the, the simplified, we want our kids to be happy. That's that social emotional. We want our kids to be fulfilled. We want them to give back. We want them to have a degree. We want the kids to walk out of our, off our stage into the world ready. So they painted that vision. The interesting thing is that's the same vision that every district in Kansas should be working on. And we forget that sometimes. So the last week, I, I guess the easiest way to talk about setting a vision, last week I met with many superintendents and principals and we talked about building our dream school. And when we talked about our dream school, we started with our vision. What's the vision for a dream school? And as always, when you get in, get in, in Zoom meetings, you go to breakouts. And they spent about 15 minutes talking about what their dream school would look like. So when we came back, none of them talked about the location or having a swimming pool or a new turf. What they talked about was the needs of their kids. And it was so, it was so interesting. These are people from across the state talking about the same things Kansans told us. They wanted, they wanted the, the students to have student-centered learning. They wanted it to be personalized. They wanted the students to be able to connect and, and have the, 
meaningful learning, what we would call purposeful learning on a, on a daily basis. They wanted engagement. They wanted the relationships between teachers and students and teachers and community to, to be the driving focus of their dream school. So we started visiting a little bit and, and I said, well, what brought you to this? Well, as Brad just alluded to, the pandemic has taught us so many things. And one of those things it taught us was we can do things differently. And some things we've done, even in the midst of, of challenges, have been better. So they talked about the good things that they had, they had been able to develop. And then they decided to make sure that these are the things they wanted to do going forward. Well, I'm sitting there listening to these ideas thinking, you've just described Apollo 3. We get to build a dream school focused on what's best for our kids. And we get to connect all the dots, basically from what Kansas told us they needed to the things we know our kids need. So the first thing you have to do is take that vision that the state board set, connect it to the district vision, and then your building decides your why. This is why we do this. This is what drives us. And then as a leader and, and as a teacher, you have to build that culture to make that happen. So the next step after you decide what you want to do and why we're going to do it is you find out where the gaps are. And some of the gaps are our kids in poverty. Some of our gaps had to do with our kids from equity. Uh, some of our gaps had to do because we've always done the same things. Uh, Brad refers to it, the, 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 the committee of 10 in 1892, when we decided what we needed to do in 1892, that's a long time ago. I mean, that's, a, that's older than I am. So when you think about this, we've got to do something different. So when you determine what the gaps are, you, you start building the goals. The interesting thing is there are districts that are trying to do this on their own. And some of them have been done it very well. But if you're saying, well, we'd like to do this too, but where do we begin? Well, today you're going to get to meet the people that can help you do that. The people that know exactly how to guide those conversations and let you, let you empower your kids to make that happen. So the next, the, Sarah's getting ready to move the slide, and I'm not ready to get quite yet, Sarah. Make sure you establish your goals and use the data. And we have lots of data. You say, well, I don't have any. You have lots of data, as much social emotional as anything else. So we know there's gaps for our kids in those needs. So how are we going to address those? And then you get to research and implement the strategies that will help you accomplish your goals. There are ways to do this. Some of them are technical right? There's technical solutions. Some of them are adaptive. I would tell you, if you're going to be working with lots of people, it's going to be adaptive. So let's, let's, we're going to move to the next slide, and we're going to connect navigating next to the, to the redesign principles. Now, Tammy and Jay and Sarah are going to go into depth on the redesign principles, but there are, there are a guiding document that, that built by Navigating Next that, that's going to, it's been built by Kansans to support your transition out of a pandemic. So these were the steps that they talked about. You need to assess student learning. Where are we at both academically and socially, social and emotional? How are we going to provide the supports they need to give them the academics that, that are required? What social and emotional delivery are we going to use? Are we gonna communicate and engage with families, learning environment considerations, and physical operations? All of those connect right back to the redesign principles, knowing that we have to personalize learning. We have to let kids move at their pace. When a student masters, masters the content, why are we sitting there making that person shuffle through when we could be moving them at a, at a better pace? I think it will create time in your systems. You'll be, able to, you'll be able to help the kids who have the highest needs and let the kids who are working at their pace go better, faster, learn, it, learn as they go. We have to build the family, business, and community partnerships. Sarah, you are clicking those. I feel like I'm, I'm on the match game here. So family, businesses, community partnerships, we have to engage the community. We know we can't do this alone. Okay, We need their help and they need our help. Okay, real world applications, making that, making the learning purposeful so that when, when the student, student leaves our system, 
they, they're gaining something that, that fulfills what they want to do, not necessarily what we want to do. The, Dewey says we can't teach for our past, we have to teach for our students' future. And then of course the student success skills. Now, Sarah, I'm ready for you to hit, there you go. We need to find out how they're doing. And then of course, how are we gonna support the challenges that they have? The guiding principles from Navigating Next had two major, two major talking points to, to help everything we do. We need to make sure that we, we ensure equity. Okay, you probably read that. We have to ensure equity for each child. Okay, and we have to use innovation. So those all connect those dots to what we're trying to do. Sarah, I'm ready for, the, for my last slide. So if you look at this, you can see, it, it, literally you're, you've connected the dots. If you take the redesigned principles, it just merges perfectly with navigating next. So I, I'm thinking, well, I'd like to do these things, but I don't know where to begin. Well, today is the day you get to hear from Tammy and Jay and Sarah and, and, and the service centers who support this and, and your team builders that actually help you make this happen. So it is great to see you. It's great to see two Greg Clarks. I mean, it was a highlight of my day. And uh, I, I'll, as I move forward, I'm gonna let you go. But if you're thinking about making a difference for kids, I can't think of a better way than, than to take this trip and try Apollo 3. So I'll turn it over to Sarah, Tammy and Jay. Thank you, Doug. So for this next section, we're just going to tell you what is redesign. We're kind of going to demystify it a bit. You've probably heard some things. You probably have read some things. Um, but we're going to go through and really talk about the principles, the process, and the culture. It really is that simple. Three things, principles, process, and culture. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah to talk about those principles. Yep, thanks. So we have our four uh, redesigned principles that came from those community conversations that um, Dr. Neuenswander, Dr. Watson had as they went across the state of Kansas. Um, and these four areas are not things that you focus on in isolation, um, but things that when you account for all of them uh, collectively, you know that you're meeting those needs of each and every student not just the academic needs, but those other components of a successful high school graduate as well. And so we have our four redesigned principles and you'll notice there's that cog in the center because they all work to support one another. You can't do one well without impacting the others. And so we have student success skills, which focus on that social emotional uh, component of student learning. Um, but then those other competencies from that uh, college and career competency framework, like perseverance, integrity, uh, self-regulation. We have family business and community partnerships. Uh, we know that students are successful when the team around them is working in mutual uh, benefit for that student. So those uh, mutually beneficial collaborative relationships. We have personalized learning. And this is a Kansas definition of personalized learning. We worked with um, our various stakeholder groups to create this definition to really be reflective of what we think personalized learning should mean for Kansas students. Um, so we believe that personalized learning places the whole child at the center of instruction, that there has to be those strong relationships between those invested stakeholder groups, and that there's equity and choice in time, place, path, pace, and demonstration of learning. And then the last redesign principle is real world application, giving students real opportunities to uh, engage in learning experiences, to have um, opportunities to do things that matter to them. Um, and one of, example of real world application can be that project based learning. And we actually have a project based learning showcase on our website right now of Kansas students and Kansas teachers and redesigned schools um, bringing that principle to life, using those success skills to, to bring a project to fruition, getting to explore something that matters to them and personalizing that opportunity um, and bringing in the community to make that happen. So uh, we've got some really great examples of how these principles can work together. And, and culminate in something really meaningful for students. So that's just a little bit about what we mean when we talk about the redesigned principles. And Jay is gonna to talk to us a little bit about the process. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So from the principles, which are our pillars, which what we asked 
schools to redesign around those four those four principles this is the redesign process so and, and it's unique to kansas we don't know of, and, and it's also not it's not uh, exclusive to school improvement this is more of a, a business model you can use you can use design thinking in the four disciplines of execution what i'm going to show you here in a second for any industry to make transformational change happen. And so we've blended these two models. We intentionally went outside of education for improvement processes, felt like something fresh needed to be introduced. As we think about, you know, as Doug talked about schools thinking about their dream school, we think design thinking is the perfect process to make that happen. That's, that, blend, that design thinking step, the first step is empathize. So a lot of you, are very empathetic. I think educators on the whole are very empathetic. And right now, if you think about, you're probably thinking a lot about how students are faring, how staff is faring. That's where this process starts. You start with how are our students doing? We even have an activity where you get down to one student. You think about that student, um, Greg Clark, number one, the, the student that you spend the most time with, right? That's, that's the, that's the, um, uh, one of those students. So as soon as I said that, Greg left left the camera. So, um, but it starts with empathizing, and then you move to defining, which is you take those things that you found through empathizing with your students and staff. You define your needs. That really translates into your goals. Um, you ideate, which is the fun part. You you brainstorm solutions to those needs, um, and then yeah, as we go here, Sarah, you got some more clicking to do, but. Um, yeah, same thing that, that Doug kind of had, but, um, you know, with defining, you focus on what's wildly important. You set those goal areas and your lag measures, your overall lag measures, uh, which are, are measures of how you're doing in your goals after the work is done. So when you get to ideate, um, that's brainstorming solutions and that that leads then into prototyping, which you actually build out some models, build out some strategies. Um, and actually put them in practice and, and test them out a little bit. In the 4DX language, we call that lead measures. Strategies are called lead measures. They lead and leverage your lag measures. So I'll bring this all together. I know this is kind of uh, these blending these two together. But once you get to empathize, define, ideate, prototype, you test those models and strategies with students. So in a small, in a small way, uh, you know, just kind of experimental, you're testing out these strategies. While you're doing that, you're keeping a compelling scoreboard and you're holding accountability meetings. So um, the design thinking process really lends itself to exactly what Doug was talking about, student-focused, student-centered solutions. It's not about the physical environment, that comes, that may be secondary, but it's about the students and their needs. And design thinking focuses in on student-focused solutions. It also is a very creative and innovative process, which you saw, that's a big piece of navigating next. And I, I can think, I can say this with full confidence, we're, we're, we're maximizing our creativity and our innovation right now. Let's continue to leverage that thinking. So think of design thinking as something that Picasso, you know, a famous artist would use to create something creative and, and innovative. The four, the four disciplines of execution, just from the sound, just saying that, you know what it's all about. It's all about execution. So it's narrowing down to what's most important and it's finding strategies that act as levers to what's most important. Um, and it's also keeping score. People play differently when you keep score. There's no doubt about that. And it's also a way to hold each other accountable to that which you've planned and put together. Think of the four disciplines of execution where Picasso is design thinking. Think of the 4DX as Vince Lombardi drawing up the sweep, right? A football coach who's saying, this is the way it needs to go. And you execute, execute, execute. Here's the thing. Schools learn these two pro this blended redesign process very well during the plan year. We take you step by step through this process. You learn it deeply. You replicate it over and over past that plan year. You continue to go through the steps of, of, 
of uh, design thinking in 40X and replicate those. And they're in many cycles. It doesn't take a year to get through this. You can move through design thinking in 40X relatively quickly, right? And it's also not nonlinear. You're, it, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's nonlinear, sorry. Uh, double negative there, but it's nonlinear. So you're gonna move uh, at different, whatever your needs are, that's the step that you might go to. So again, that's unique to Kansas. That's our redesign process, uh, blending design thinking and 40X. And you'll continue to cycle through that as you move through redesign. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Tammy and so she can talk about our culture. Thank you, Jay. So one of the things that um, we learned early on with our <clears throat> Mercury and our Gemini One schools is that when you coach schools through that process, and have them um, engage every single one of their staff members to really make a difference within the school, it changes the school's culture. And so um, as schools go through redesign, their culture really changes and it really grows. And so we wanted to provide you a couple of academic resources that just validate and verify this process. And so um, the constructs that make up a positive learning culture for schools are these constructs here. Um, does your school have a shared vision? And we'll help you with that. Um, do, you, do your teachers have strong collective efficacy? This process teaches teachers how to have a voice and how to lead. Um, is your culture focused on inquiry, innovation, and exploration? It may not be yet, but by the end of the plan year, you will be. Um, are, you, are your principals modeling learning leadership? This process teaches that. And does your staff experience psychological safety? Because people cannot be creative if they don't feel safe. And so um, this Cools at Al 2020 is a study that really highlights these types of uh, constructs for school culture. And that's maybe a benefit um, of going through redesign is that you will, um, you'll change your culture. And what we found with redesign schools throughout this last year is where they had strengthened their culture um, and they were focused on inquiry, innovation, and exploration. Um, the things that they had to work through with, the, with COVID-19 was just an, another thing to do. It was just the next thing, meeting their students' needs. They had a process, they could make rapid decisions um, and no, it wasn't easy, um, but it certainly was doable. And so when you have a culture that can tackle adaptive challenges, it's not going to matter what comes your way. You're going to be equipped to make the decisions that you need. So with that, Sarah, talk about the timeline. Yep. So this is just a snapshot of what you can expect when you join Redesign. So the plan year is that initial year. That's where you are creating that why and that vision. You're establishing those goals. You're learning that process for researching, prototyping, and testing. And you're creating a plan of how you're going to continue that innovation over the course of the next few years. So that plan year is heavily supported. You have um, uh, consistent meetings. You have a coach that you work with. And that launch year, that support becomes a little more individualized. Your focus is on implementation, um, monitoring your data, making sure that you're having the impact that you set out to have, um, and using that design thinking process to make those quick changes as needed. And again, that support is a little bit more personalized. Um, if you have um, individual coaching or if you just kind of work with a small group of peers, and then we have um, kind of what comes after that initial plan, initial launch is what we call the ascent. And that's where you're focusing on kind of that holistic support for your strategies through ongoing professional development. You're evaluating to see that impact and, and continuing to make those um, adjustments through reflection and revision. So this is just kind of what you can expect for that process um, and that support kind of um, gradually releasing over time, but um, continuing to have support in each of these of these years and phases of the redesign process. So that's just a quick snapshot. Um, and now we're going to turn it over to Kim Mock. She's from Southwest Plains. 
She's going to talk with us a little bit about the plan year support that you can expect from a regional service center um, and just kind of what you can anticipate when jumping into the plan year. So Kim, we'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. Just want to take a little bit of time and highlight a few things that you're already aware of, which is the power of collaboration. It's been great to see how service centers, KSBE, KASB, come together to help support this process. So that will continue as you work with your team to determine what it is that you're wanting to accomplish and how you wanna go about that. So what we wanna talk with you a little bit about today is trainings that will be able be available to support you, as well as what some homework with your team, what might look like, and then just that basic process of your why, your vision, and what that end result will be. So if we take a look at um, the regional workshops, our plan for the year, you can see that we do have workshops at each service center that are attended by your school redesign team. Um, again, KSDE staff, as well as your team and um, service centers will be available to support you. In addition to those face-to-face -face opportunities, there will also be some virtual check-ins just to touch base to make sure that you're moving along and um, never have to feel alone because there are people here to help you. And then also a minimum of one on-site visit in the spring. And, and I do want to tell you, you know, if, if you need more or less of what you see here on the screen, obviously we can meet your needs based upon what's happening in the context of your district. And I, I think that's the most important piece in part here. You have so many opportunities and so many resources, but the way you utilize in your, these in your district will, will be different. And I think that's what's so exciting about this redesign process, making it your own, working together collaboratively with your team, your superintendent, those identified, um, which, which is kind of what we'll talk about next, thinking about teams and planning for that year beyond. So um, Sarah, if we can move to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about your school redesign team, as well as your goal area investigation team. What I wanna stress here is that you don't have to know right now who's gonna be a part of that um, because we do have resources to support those conversations. I'm sure you all right now can turn to that group of individuals that are there to help and support any different initiatives that you have going on. But what we're really trying to do here is to empower your teachers, empower your administrators to be able to lead and guide this charge. After um, the designation of, of team members, then we're really gonna take a look at um, buildings, selecting two to four goal areas, and each staff member in a building is a, is a part of at least one of those goal area investigation teams, the gates. So again, thinking about whether or not someone should be a, a key pilot or a co-pilot, definitely there are considerations here. We realize um, in all districts, there's a lot going on, but making sure you're bringing people to the table that wanna be a part of um, trying new things, thinking outside the box and, and just moving those pieces forward. Another fact sheet that we have talks about how all of these leadership roles kind of fit together for that pilot and co-pilot, as well as the principal, the board of ed and the superintendent. As we all would know, collaboration is key, but knowing how all of those parts fit together will really help this initiative to move forward within your district. If we can move down now into the turnkey process. So thinking about this, there's really two things that I want us to think about and consider here. As you're going through these trainings, we're giving you content and walking you through all these activities to assist you in engaging in this design thinking to plan your school redesign. As you participate, you should always be thinking about what you will be taking back to your staff and how you're going to deliver that. Again, understanding that everyone's context is different, so there's no right or wrong way. The second thing is to assist you with planning how you're gonna turnkey this out in your district. We do have a communication log that um, we'll ask you to use it to help just think through this process and our time together. Um, you're not obligated to use this, but it's highly encouraged just because this communication log can help you plan and track your progress and implement that system of accountability. So you can see here, we have the flight team, 
that regional training support that we'll um, be implementing, as well as that school redesign team, and then moving it into that full school approach. So again, it's a process. Um, and as I think everyone kind of alluded to already, there's probably great things that you're already starting. It's really just now giving you some resources and supports to put this into play. So as we move forward, thinking about communicating now, you know, what this work will be about, is it worth it, planning for change, I think really you have to just stop and consider what's happening in your district and knowing what it is that you're wanting to accomplish. And sometimes we have those ideas, we have those thoughts, and we just need a little extra support. And that's why I would highly recommend just going through this process and knowing that you're not alone. Also thinking about it's not about the what, but the how. It will be how you do your business moving forward. And, you know, that could continue to evolve. As Jay was talking about with the, with the empathizing and, and knowing that some of our goals may take a couple months to do. Others may take a little bit longer just because we're having to really think about our prototype and testing and, and moving forward with those pieces. So the final piece I want to talk with you about is just the benefits of the regional training. The best piece is just really being able to collaborate with others and learn from each other, being able to share and, and, and feel like you're a part of those conversations and that you're not alone knowing that there's continuous support from, from dedicated coaches at your service centers at KSDE to support this process as you move it forward. In addition, there's that built-in accountability to help keep us on track. Um, whether or not you use the communication log or whether you're utilizing different resources that maybe you and your team define as you work through this process, that's fine as well. And then finally, just the freedom to do what's best for your students that's supported with a framework. I think all of us would agree that redesign and our school improvement processes are all making opportunities and resources available for our students to ensure we're doing the best job we can for them. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to how do you make time for redesign to Tammy, Jay, and Sarah. Thanks, Kim. So th this is a question we get quite often, uh, and specifically it's in the context of I can't my plate is already full. How am I going to add redesign to the plate? We had that question early on, and one of our one of our redesign principals at a middle school finally stood up and said to his staff, "Redesign is the plate. It's the whole plate." So that that's one thing that just kind of that context of what what you're undertaking is school improvement. It's your entire school. You're rethinking and reimagining everything that goes on within that school. So it is the plate. And the time commitment that, that we kind of shape it as and frame it as is really based on uh, with the, through the four disciplines of execution that you have basically, as far as time, uh, two large buckets that take up your time. It's the whirlwind, which is your day job, and Amy, I'm, I'm looking at you. I know you've got things going on today that's probably probably classified there in the whirlwind, right? Things that you just have to do that have to be taken care of. Kids needs uh, need to be met. Um, those are the urgent things. Things are going to pop up. And I know uh, the whirlwind is really strong in schools, right? It's very always been strong. But you also have goals or new activities that are important, and those two continually clash every day, right? Um, and guess what happens when they clash? Urgency will win out every time. If you think about it, if something's urgent versus something that's important, you have to take care of that which is urgent. So what we promote is that when you're looking at the week that you try to, to you know, justify or square away 20% of your week to focus on what's important. Now, Google was famous for this. Google was probably the, the uh, inventor of 20% time. You know, Google basically back in the early 2000s told their employees, take one day a week. Stay with me here. I'm not talking about, we're, we're not going one day a week for three design, but for Google, they basically told their employees, take one day out of your week and spend time working on a passion project. Something that you want to work on, whether that was collaborative or whether it was individual, that's what, the, that's, that's what they told their employees at Google. 
once they implemented 20% time, that 20% became a large majority of the innovation uh, that, that drove Google into to where they are now, which is a giant company. You know, things like Google Mail was developed, they, Google Mail was developed by a Google employee who was using their 20% time. So that's one of their main drivers. So how might that look in a school? Your teachers take one or two plan periods a week and they work on a redesign related project that they're passionate about, right? Um, they can work in groups so they can work as an individual. You utilize existing teacher collaboration on PLC time. Maybe you repurpose some of your existing staff meetings. But when you, when you, it's not taken one day of the week, but if you could take a few hours here and there, your school redesign team each week, uh, by encouraging teachers to focus on that small part of their week, it's something they're passionate about, it can really drive the creativity and innovation you're, you're looking for in redesign. And that'll be important for your success through the plan year uh, to look at that 80-20 80, 80, kind of frame. So with that, I'm going to move it on to... Thank you, Jay. Um, I'm excited to introduce Jacqueline Fitzmeyer to you. She is from Clay County Schools, USD 379. And she's going to tell us about their experience with um, having Gemini 2 and um, Apollo 2 schools. So Jacqueline, good morning. How are you today? I'm great. Um, Sarah, maybe if you would want to turn off the, um, there we go, so we can see everybody better. So tell us, Jacqueline, a little bit about Clay County and your experiences with redesign. Sure. Well, I, ha I made notes, so I hope I don't forget anything. But um, so we have, we are a countywide school district, and we have a 4A and a 1A community. Um, we have five buildings and um, we have four buildings that were Gemini two. So that would have been, they started in the 1819 school year. So this is year three for them. And then this year we all, we added our uh, fifth building um, as an Apollo two school. So, um, so now all five are in, um, all five are at a different place because, um, you know, we taught, we use the word redesign so much, but it, it's really redesigning. Um, we're never done. Nobody's ever done. And um, so that's just a little bit about the, the five buildings that we have. So. So how have you been able to make time um, for your buildings to work on these redesign elements? Can you tell us a little bit about your structures for that? Sure. Um, when when we first watched this same video um, or the same kind of presentation before Jim and I too, we had actually ordered the, the 4D um, book by Covey, which you guys obviously have used in, in this process. And that night I went to my kid's softball practice and I took it with me. And in the first chapter read about the 80-20 and the whirlwind and focusing on something important. And that's where it really soaked in what you guys were saying as far as that time. And so we actually got our teachers together, our teams together and decided, um, basically when we got the KSDE framework, there was twice a month that we would be, and we were assigned to Salina. And so we were going to be headed to Salina as a team. And we actually, um, made it happen that we on the other weeks with the exception of like a parent teacher conference or a short week during thanksgiving break or christmas we met one day a week um, on the other weeks so we were putting in that 20 percent um and the way we made that happen was first of all we have wonderful substitutes and i'm not saying we have oodles of them but we have wonderful substitutes um we paid them more for redesign days and so in year one, they got a, the board approved that if you signed up for like three fourths of the uh, redesign days, um, then you got a higher rate. And that was really appealing to them. It was closer to like a long-term rate. And that kept also consistency in our classrooms because that was something our teachers were really nervous about was being gone and out. And so it made for um, nice consistency among them. Now, <clears throat> and that was in year one. And we're doing that same thing with um, our fifth building. That's an Apollo two building. So those, t those subs are getting paid more for um, taking on those roles. 
much like um, I think Jay was saying this this year, because any given day, we don't know how many subs we're going to need, who's in quarantine or, or what may happen, because we have been on site the whole time. Um, I have seen our Apollo 2 building have to use more, um, like they'll have a lunch and learn or restructure their um, staff meetings or whatnot to meet the needs of some of the time. Like I even gave them for virtual tours to go out and see other buildings one day and they could use that seven hours, either a full day, a half day before school, after school, and they could be paid to do that. Um, we did pay any of our teams, like if we required them to come to a district meeting, we paid them as well. But um, <clears throat> let's go back to the Gemini 2. So in year one, we did stick to the once a week. Um, so usually twice with the district and twice with KSDE. And then in year two, we went to once a month with the district and then they would have just before or after school meetings, um, whatever was needed or use their lunch. And they also had their early releases to kind of touch base with their building. Now this year, um, those Gemini two buildings, they each have one day a month and then every other month the district um, gets together as well, just to kind of keep us all together. And um, we can pull off about 22 subs pretty successfully. Um, so we're gonna have to restructure and think what we're gonna do when our uh, fifth building is a, that Apollo 2 one joins in with some of those district conversations. And what we did this year was just limited the number of subs. We went from like six in a building to four or, or whatnot. And um, so that, that has helped, so. So, what did what do you think your schools learned through redesign that helped them in this past year of COVID response? Well, first, one thing I wanted to share, and I don't want Brad to think that we didn't believe Brad and Randy because we really did believe Brad and Randy off their community talks, <laughs> but um, we kind of wanted to do our own for our community. And so um, we divided up our team when we originally started and sent them out to coffee groups. Um, and the rule was if you went to a coffee group, you could not take a piece of technology. You needed like paper and pencil so you could be one with them. And um, we went to community events and whatnot, trying to get that same kind of feedback for our community. And they say the same things that their research shows, but um, it just was nice to hear it from our own people. And I really think that helped us start having these redesign conversations as a community. And honestly, um, last year when March hit, um, we, we built a framework and literally let our teams just go with it and, and it worked. And it was, um, you know, it was, it was what we could do then. But this year, um, it has really helped us. Like I said, we've been on site, but it has helped us see outside the box. Um, it has helped us use each other as a team to make decisions. That design thinking process, you know, people talk about the four redesign principles, which I think you can go read and, and gain information about what can't be replaced from this, pro, um, from the, being an Apollo 3 school is the learning that you get from KSDE and the service centers on the process in order to build teacher leaders, that design thinking, um, that is irreplaceable, um, what we have learned through that. So the question everyone on here has been waiting for would be, <laughs> what would you say to schools who are asking why now? Why in the world would Apollo, would people want to jump into Apollo 3? What do you think, Jacqueline? Well, First of all, I, I will tell you that it's it's a, it's an up and down, it's a roller coaster of emotions going through this process. But you get down and you end up building a strong foundation. You see your staff engaged and we don't know what the future holds. And we've learned so much from this last year that we have to take away and, and make better. But uh, you know, our Apollo 3, our Apollo 2 building says, why not? You know, this is the perfect time. Um, there's so much evaluation that has to be done over where our kids are and where we want them to go. And, um, you know, if you do look down the line, KISA 2.0 um, 
is going to have those redesign principles and the process as part of the rubrics. And man, I would jump on the opportunity to have the training from KSDE and the, the service centers. Um, it is it is top notch, and it will help your it will help your districts. Um, you know, I I think our community and our teachers we responded to the COVID situation because we had this training behind us, and um, I think uh, I think the responsive culture, the the fact of teaching people how to respond to change, would be beneficial for anybody at this point. All right, well, thank you so much for Zooming in with us. That's Jacqueline Bitzenmeyer from Clay County. I'm sure she would be open to any questions if you wanted to um, ask them in the chat or um, email her. Um, I'm sure she could, if you really wanted to ask a question without the state people listening in, I'm sure she would give you the lowdown. So <laughs> thanks for that. All right, well, we've got just a few minutes before the end of our time and we wanna talk about the actual application. And so one of the things um, we just wanted to let you know about the application process is that um, each system must provide evidence of approval by their school board and a letter of support from their local uh, KNEA or other professional organization. That has been true all along and it hasn't changed yet. Um, each building must provide evidence of an 80% or better uh, faculty vote in favor of redesigning. Um, you, have, you must be willing and able to um, do all you can to launch your redesign after that one year plan year. And um, you must be willing to serve as a demonstration site once we can all visit schools again. Um, systems and buildings must be willing to continue their collaboration with Kansas Can School, the school redesign project through the launch year and the ascent years. So we'll take you through a planning year, but we want you to stay engaged and um, build those relationships with other redesigned schools. Um, a couple of other application activities. Uh, this is a little different from years past, not much, but a little bit. We'd like for you in your application to really answer um, the question, why redesign? Um, we want you to um, really talk with your staff and come up with a collective, you know, this is why we really want to join redesign and this is why we'll, we want to do that now. A tip might be that you would do that in conjunction with your vote. Um, and, so, and so that's just a little bit different tweak than what we've had in the past. And then the other is we have a school culture survey. And what we're finding is that um, you might want to know what your school culture, what your strengths are, what your areas that you might wanna focus on throughout the plan year. And so we have a link here for the school culture survey. We ask that you go ahead and give it to your um, certified staff between March 22nd and April 16th. And then you can request your individual results. Again, we highly recommend this. It may not necessarily be required. Um, and if you're wondering why in the world would we use a culture survey this year, um, culture is something that goes deep and it takes a long time to change. And so um, the uh, events of this past year probably haven't changed your culture that much, might have changed the climate a little bit, but we wanted to make sure that you have access to that school culture survey. And so with that, turn it back over to Sarah. Yeah, so we're excited to kick off Apollo 3 today. We have the application uh, ready to go. It's in a Word version and PDF version. Um, we'd love if you would put your uh, contact information in the chat, your name, school, email address. Um, we would be thrilled to follow up with you after this presentation today with the link to the slides in case you need them. Um, and then the direct links to this application, it's posted on the website. Um, and it's also um, loaded in here. So if you have questions on the application, you can email um, us individually, um, or you can just email redesign at ksde.org. Um, that gets you in touch with all three of us at the same time. Um, on the application, it lets you know where to send it when you're done, um, but 
uh, we're, like I said, we're excited to kick off Apollo 3. You have that application. Um, and if you would put your contact information in the chat, we'd greatly appreciate that so that we can be in touch and make sure that you have all these links and resources um, directly. And so with that, um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It looks like we're getting you out right on time or just a minute, a minute behind. Um, if there's anything that we can help you with, please feel free to stay on. Um, and we'll be happy to answer those questions, but thank you so much for giving us your time this morning.